Welcome to the Inspirational Insights podcast and program from Insight to Action. My name is Donna Jones. I'm your host. And in this conversation, I'm very excited to have Dr. Tyson Young Caportas. Dr. Tyson is from the Appalachian clan, Western Cape York, Northern Queensland, Australia. He is an author, an academic, and a lecturer at Deakin University. But most importantly, he's just written the book called, or published the book recently called Sand Talks which is how indigenous wisdom can save the world. And certainly when we look at the world today, we could use some insight. So thank you for joining me. When you look at what's going on in the world today, between by loss of biodiversity, which is painful, at least for me, uh, mm -hmm. and also some of the other things that are going on at the human level, how does indigenous wisdom make sense of it all? <laughs> so many different ways. Um, you know, we have uh, a lot of stories, you know, from the last uh, couple of hundred years or even 500 years of, um, of our different encounters, you know, with uh, these different economic systems, uh, these experiments, you know, with capital and, um, you know, merchant mercantilism and all that sort of stuff, you know, and we've had lots of different theories to try and explain what that is. Uh, indigenous people all around the world, you know, from just that's like, oh my God, they're cannibals <laughs> or they're insane or it's crazy or they have a mental illness. I've had lots and lots of shifting theories, but we are, uh, I guess you'll see it in the book a lot, you know, talk about that our cognition is very context dependent. When not people sort of frozen in time when nothing changes for thousands of years because the land is always moving and the climate is always moving and the waters and everything else. So we're very good at adapting to changing contexts. So you'll see a myriad of theories out there in the oral cultures of um, indigenous peoples all around the world trying to <laughs> just, you know, constantly adapt to these massive changes. So I guess the uh, mob that I belong to up on Western Cape York, 500 years ago, there were um, some Dutchmen who came there <laughs> to a place that's uh, there where my homelands traditionally is as a clan member. Yeah, spoiler alert, it, the place is called Kiawea, which in Dutch means uh, turn back. <laughs> spoiler alert for the story. Yeah, they sort of came and it was a different economic system in Europe at the time. And so that was our first encounter there one of our first encounters and I guess they, they wanted to trade uh, trading things like rice and soap you know which we thought was how they were storing fat and so the people started eating the soap because it was you know obviously looked like fat to us and it was mostly fat with some ash and lye and stuff like that anyway they traded a few things and then I, I guess that they thought that because women were chattel in Europe at the time that, that women were a commodity that they then were able to have access to. And, um, and the women didn't like that very much. And so <laughs> put up a bit of a fight and yeah, that fight resulted in most of them getting killed, the Dutch people. And um, you know, the few who were left, the handful that was left jumped on the ship and managed to get it back to Amsterdam or wherever. And when they got back there, you know, they were in trouble for, because they, you know, the people who backed, backed the, um, the voyage, uh, they were out of pocket. And so, you know, there was trouble there. So out of that failure, they, they found a way to shift accountability and they, they invented the world's first corporation. So, so the Dutch East India company, they invented the world's first corporation. And, um, and so out of the, and then there were copycat ones. So one came up in England as well. And then of course, um, you know, under British law and most of European law, land could not be capital in those days. Land is, was not something that, you know, if you failed to pay back your debts, they couldn't seize your land, you know, take land away from you. Uh, but these corporations had that idea that that could be a way of, you know, if they could make that law, they could take land from indigenous people in the Americas and elsewhere. And so they started doing that idea. It's like, oh, we'll give you some mirrors and a couple of tomahawks and um, you just sign, you make your mark here on this piece of paper and we'll just give you those things. 
And then they come back in a couple of years and say, well, we always hold the money, you know, and interest. And people would say, well, what's money? And then they'd just go, all right, well, we're going to have to take your land because you agreed to that. So they started using, you know, land was something that you could, it was capital that you could leverage, you know, for debt and that you could speculate on then, of course, in the markets and all that sort of thing. And so that was the birth of the global financial system as we know it. And it was our fault because we speared those Dutchmen. <laughs> Circles so back we to should that probably, event. <laughs> we should probably apologize uh, to the world for... <laughs> it's like, oops. <laughs> it's like butterfly effect. How do you know how these things are going to start? You know, but there you go. But you it's also... A Dutchmen and you, and you, 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 you inadvertently cause a, a financial system that, that's going to eat the planet alive. You know, because that spread then, once it, 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 once it was used to, to steal and parcel all the lands of indigenous people in the southern hemisphere, it then uh, got transferred to the northern hemisphere and, and land became capital and every inch of soil on the planet was, um, you know, parceled up into these little squares with different values and, um, and, and off I went. And, you know, and basically that it's everything, um, you know, futures trading and derivatives and everything has, has grown out of that. Basically, you know, a massive pyramid scheme that's, um, that's developed globally. <laughs> this yeah. Anglosphere that's now everywhere. Cause you know, if you want to be in business, you better be speaking English. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. So it's very much a, a, an Anglo sort of uh, business model that's come out which I think your original Anglos, Anglo-Saxons, Normans there in um, England and the Celts as well, you know, that culture that developed there, if they saw what was going on, they'd be, they'd be horrified. You know, they'd be like, no, that's not the Anglo way. You know, <laughs> land is land. And, you know, you look at the Scandinavian countries now where they came from and they still have things like um, uh, Olmansrotten or whatever they call it, that, that, that law that, anybody is allowed to kill. There's no such thing as homelessness because anybody can camp anywhere. Anybody can forage food or fish or pick food, mushrooms, anywhere they like. You know, nobody can say <laughs> they've got very different um, attitude towards land as property there. So I think the system that's come out, it's not because of an Anglo culture. The Anglo culture, uh, culture is actually quite inimical to it. So it's really a temporary glitch. And I guess when the pyramid scheme collapses, then perhaps we can, you know, readjust back to some sensible idea of what land is, um, that land is our habitat. It's not um, capital to seize and then leverage for debt upon debt upon debt upon debt until it all falls down. Mm. So now that's beautiful. That's a beautiful way of getting started on this because when <clears throat> then COVID and what the, basically the, the suspension of economic activity and now everybody's sort of clawing back, I think is the expression I've heard some people say, we're clawing back to the past. We need to get everything back up and going. And there's just so much fear yeah. around the current economic system collapsing. Mm. And yet it's also a massive opportunity to design or, or at least reform, or there's so many views on this. <laughs> What, what's your view on what could come out of this from an economic point of view that would be well, far better for everyone? I, I just, I think, I mean, I think you're on the right track with complexity theory and the complexity sciences, you know, anyone who's applying that to economics or anything else, you know, is, um, is on the right track. <laughs> the system is in, a, it's in hysteresis right now, you know, you know, people crave uh, homeostasis, and when they've been in homeostasis in a complex system for a while, they, I think they assume that that's normal. So you hear everybody either talking about getting back to normal or a new normal, mm. but nobody's sort of thinking very much beyond, well, the definition of what normality is. And, you know, perhaps normality is not something that we're going to be, uh, you know, just it's not going to be a can that we're kicking down the road anymore. Yeah, we as humans are, are um, yeah, we're in a, a stage of transition ecologically, but geologically, you know, this uh, Anthropocene is a is an era of transition and it's quite a long one economically, socially, in every way, you know, you know, this uh, sort of failed experiment of globalism, 
which kind of has misapplied sort of reductive models and linear models that came out of ways of controlling regions and groups of regions and nations, you know, as, as nation, the world's nations formed like only about a century ago, you know, that's kind of been a flawed model too, a flawed experiment. And so they're really trying to apply silly models that didn't really work in a previous era to an era that's now trying to return to a normal that, I don't know, there's always this idea of, you know, some glorious past that we have to return to, <laughs> you know, the kind of people who are into that. There's this, always this idea that there, there was some golden age to get back to and everybody's looking there and people are even digging in paleolithic pasts to find better diets and <laughs> things like that. There are lessons to be learned from the past. But, you know, the idea that there's a, there was a recent sort of golden age in the last few centuries that we can somehow return to is, um, nah, that's not it. Yeah. You have to adapt, you know, you, you got to be like as a, as a node in a complex system, you do have to be adaptive. You know, we're all required to be that or the system uh, will not be able to adapt either. You know what happens when a system stops moving. Collapse yeah collapse yeah hard hard yeah. collapse yeah and i guess i mean a growth based model growth based model is a problem you know because it's about size which is a problem when you got men running everything <laughs> <laughs> especially small ugly men you know politics is um you know show business for ugly people <laughs> you've got small <laughs> ugly men running everything they tend to be obsessed with size and so they want growth but the idea of growth is in the size of the economy mm. and the size of their stockpiles of, of missiles and <laughs> things. But yeah, that, that's a sort of a wrong idea of growth. Example, yeah. you want to grow the economy um, and you think that the growth is what's going to make it healthy. But if you looked in a different way, like from an Aboriginal perspective, we'd be more interested in the velocity of the dollar. You know. Okay, so tell me about that. What does well, that if mean you increase, exactly? if you increase the velocity of the dollar, you know, then, then you're increasing the health of that system, you know, and I guess if you use a metaphor that's understandable in, in complexity theory terms, it, you know, every node in that system, you know, one of the principles is interaction. You, you need that exchange of energy and information going across between as many nodes as possible. And the more that's happening, the more connections you get between different nodes, the healthier the system is. It's the same with, with your brain, you know, neuroplasticity science that looks at the same thing. It has to apply complexity models because it's not the size of your brain. It's going to make you smarter. I mean, you could genetically modify your head to be twice as big and your brain to be twice as big, but you're still going to get stupid people because they're just not making the neural connections. It's the amount of neural connect. You've got the potential for trillions and trillions of connections that we're just not using right now. So instead of making your brain bigger, increase the amount of neural connections you're having and you'll be smarter. <laughs> it's the same principle. And so for us uh, in, a, in a sort of a, an indigenous view of the world, so our idea of growth is more, we, we would call it increase. So we have traditionally, we have these increased ceremonies and they're, they're about increasing relationships and connections within the ecosystem and social system that which is one thing uh, if you do that then you're increasing the fertility of the place you're increasing what the place produces and you know uh, uh, sustainably perpetually and you need these increased ceremonies as custodians for you to be able to understand and make the connections and see the entire system and to stimulate all of that interactivity that's needed for a truly complex system to thrive. Yeah, so uh, as soon as I see that, you know, I see complexity science applied to uh, economics, you know, I recognize that. That's, uh, you know, straight away, I see that the path through there is, is, is about an increased paradigm instead of a growth paradigm. And they sound like the same thing, but they're subtly different, yeah. <laughs> Well, it's, you know, I'm, I appreciate that because when I was playing around with my writing the other day, having heard this concept, I thought, mm -hmm. okay, what, what would I put in here, growth or increase? And, and I thought, well, then there's increase what? And when you put in connections, it's really about increasing relationships, increasing the yeah. quality of the relationship, the, mm -hmm. the values of the relationship, you know, 
and all of that. So that that's how it strikes me. I don't know. Mm. Well, yeah. it seems to me like a, a paradigm that is really taking off right now. Hopefully, you know, everybody seems to be doing it. From Nora Bateson's, Bateson's warm data yep. uh, business to to everything else. You know, um, you know there are so many, you know, software platforms and 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 consultants and and all kinds of things that are going into organizations and and companies and and earning top dollar to um to actually shift the organizations towards that that kind of thinking yeah. you know in their in their leadership models their their organizational structures their um the way they focus on end users and make that information uh that relationship more um more productive and 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 vigorous Th these are really interesting the way the the agile folk are running their teams and and you know setting all that so there seems to be a shift towards that that's not ideological you know because you see you know hippies creating these things and you see like neocons creating the same things as well you know it's just a handful of stubborn people you know on both sides who are still i don't know it's trying to sell us this idea of normal normalcy and, and a return to normalcy whatever the hell what yeah. and we had like just 10 years of you know a, a yeah. sort of thinly veiled recession which they, they went with the quantity you know they quantitative easing <laughs> for after that collapse just to try and kick the can down the road a bit but they probably need to look at some kind of qualitative easing mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. they're after a soft landing and and that would be more about you know increasing the relationships and the interconnections between things and i don't just mean you know oh you know us talking about our kids and doing some paper mache together i, I don't mean that kind of relationship but <laughs> although that does sound like fun <laughs> the connectedness between things yeah. or between you know every data point between every mm. no between every agent in the system you know animate and inanimate human and non-human you get these things happening, then you get something that, that, that will result in a more sort of dynamic balance. And I guess balance is important and we can get into the ideological side of, of that where, where, you know, indigenous notions of balance could um, sort of perhaps help out with some of that. I think yeah. that would be, I think that would be excellent. And I, I'd also like to just touch on a little bit about the, you know, if you look at the intersection and the relationships around the connection, to me, there's that word empathy in the center. You know, yeah. the one that sort of is the, um, it, it, it sort of modulates the synapse of, of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Do you want to speak to that a little bit? I mean, you know, I, I guess, you know, all the, the sort of soft skill side of things and, and kind of uh, woo-woo side of things is always attributed to us. So we're, we're kind of always um, lumped in with this, oh, Indigenous peoples have empathy and all that sort of thing. <laughs> you know, it's an empathetic culture and we can learn about empathy from indigenous people. But I don't know, like uh, there's so many false separations. You know, look, empathy in the first place, e empathy is, is something you have from something, you, you know, towards something that you're separate from. And in, in our worldview, we're not separate from all of these things, even from our enemies, that everything is your relation. You're related to everything. So you're already connected. What, what's, what's the point of trying to stick empathy in the middle of that? Okay, beautiful. Because you, you. you already are that and that is you. And, you know, yeah. <laughs> like yeah. empathy, empathy is something that's, uh, it's kind of a transitional culture thing. You know, it needs to exist between two things that are trying to come together and neither of them know how to do it. It's like empathy is like training wheels for people who don't know how to relate. <laughs> that's excellent that's and a wonderful image i love that this highest ideal you know like this um christ-like thing that you know you can achieve and and then you'll be this ascended actualized being if you if you get empathy but no you're just on the bottom rung of the ladder <laughs> <laughs> you've got empathy you're like okay that's kindergarten mm. <laughs> for yeah. relatedness yeah yeah. Um, so now when, when people hear the word balance, I, I know that a lot of people go straight into, uh, it's absolute, it's an absolute state, it's going to be just like that, but it's not. So let's talk about balance from the, from the Indigenous point of view. Yeah, well, <clears throat> but I, I mean, I guess even that's a construct 
See, there are no, in, um, you know, the language I speak, other than English, you know, all the Aboriginal languages I've worked with, I've worked with a lot of Aboriginal languages all over the continent, and I have connections and relations, you know, across a lot of different groups. And in all of the, in all the languages that I know, there aren't a lot of abstract nouns. And there's no abstract nouns in, in mine because that, that's just how you, you start this separation of things. You know, so the idea of things coming into balance, you know, these things happen in nature with fresh water, salt water, you know, high ground, low ground, red soil, black soil, all those sorts of things. You know, these things have balance and in the liminal spaces in between are really creative, generative sort of spaces. But then to start to create these abstracts like nature and society is to separate those things. And then I guess people would think it, it, it would be an indigenous idea of balance to try and balance the needs of those things. <laughs> and it's, it's hard to talk outside of our own way of being w without talking like that. But that's just kind of a halfway place, you know? And so I talk about that a lot, the balance between the needs of people and the land. But really, we shouldn't be separate things. You know, we, we're, we're in that same system. We're one thing. So separating them out is, is difficult. And, and artificial. Yeah, it's artificial. And, and often, you know, we have these binaries set up where we attribute things from one side as being indigenous attributes and, um, and that others are attributes of, on the other side, it's attributes of modernity. You know, so it would be really, I don't know, it's so tempting to go into this narrative of, you know, well, Western systems and cultures and economies they're individualistic and aboriginal indigenous cultures are, are all cooperative and communal and sharing and yeah both of those things are true like to an extent you know but they're also not <laughs> because i mean aboriginal culture is also highly individualistic but it, it's both so usually when there's a binary, you know, both of those things are true. So, you know, I, I could, it's just as much of my life, me going, nay, nay, ah, like, ah, I'm me, you know, fabulous me, <laughs> you know, and culturally, you know, you assert your, um, your exceptional difference and your uniqueness and your individuality at the same time that, that sits within a, a network of obligations and communal responsibilities and identity whereby, you know, it's hard to say who you are without saying who you're related to and what you're related to in that system. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's yeah, both yeah. of those things at once. Your pattern, your pattern of being within a network of communal relations is unique. That's part of your unique pattern, you know, so, I mean, uh, people, I mean, so there's this ideological sort of terror in, in the modern era of um, being subsumed into some kind of institutionalized hive mind of like everybody's exactly the same and uniform. And, and so there should be because that's, that's, that would be the end of creation. You know, we know that in complex systems, it doesn't work like that. Just because you're all being nice to each other and all working towards the same goal and doing the same thing, that does not make you a complex system. And that system will probably break down. Yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? You, I mean, the principle, one of the first principles is, is diversity That's in a complex system. And that's, I mean, and that doesn't just mean, you know, nodes interacting with other nodes that are completely dissimilar. That also means that you as a node you need to distinguish yourself from the nodes around you that are most similar to you. Everything has to have its unique fingerprint or the diversity breaks down. Mm -hmm. So when you get these little narcissistic flash mobs sort of forming, you know, in these echo chambers that they all have the same algorithm. <laughs> oh my goodness. You know, and just like zombies, just sort of, um, that, <laughs> That's just terrifying to me because I see cultures breaking down and not just dominant cultures, but I see minority cultures clustering around these idealized versions of minority identities. 
with everybody's, you know, policing each other, you know, and doing purity tests on each other for and policing their language and their, everybody's got to have the same way of doing it or, you know, they're kicked out of the group. That, that's terrifying to me because I see the breakdown of our cultures occurring in that. Mm-hmm. And you see the same thing in mainstream cultures. You know, um, identities become an interesting thing. There are so many different identities now and we think that means diversity, but it's not. There's this overwhelming conformity that's going on in these groups and those groups break it down and then eventually everything breaks down. You know, um, So yeah, ideologically, the idea of balance in our way, it's a dynamic balance and it's a constant coming together and moving apart and this constant exchange, you know, so when fresh water and salt water meet, you get, and they, they meet periodically in cycles, you know, seasonal cycles of, of wet season, you know, monsoon kind of time, you know, and um, at those times, you know, brackish water is created temporarily and those areas of brackish water are very dynamic and very creative and they produce all kind, kinds of seasonal things just burst out from that, you know? So you, the storm bird comes in then and is attracted to that. And the storm bird calls out and the call of the storm bird brings the freshwater sharks down the freshwater river and down to the sea and they swim along the coast. And then those things signal other things mm. that start happening. And it's just this cascading, you know, effect of symbiosis in, a, in, in, this, in this dynamic time of increase. It's just wonderful. Now, the idea of separating those things out into their different groups and, you know, idealizing the freshwater sharkiness of the freshwater sharks and <laughs> just have them all sit up in their river going, <laughs> you know, no, we're not storm birds. We're freshwater sharks. Go away. You know, <laughs> I don't care which way the water's going. I can see the animation. Yeah. And there's like, <laughs> there's lightning is so important in that time. And, you know, I, I don't know we, if, if everything stops interacting dynamically, then it kind of falls apart. Yeah. It's that velocity, that increase. It's a different thing. Can we talk about the relationship between diversity and distributed cognition? Yeah. Because yeah. I think, I think, you know, when I listen to diversity, to me, the word resilience keeps running up. In other words, there's a bounce factor that goes in. If, if bad things happen, it's because there, there's enough diversity that it can bring things back to a, you know, as yeah. you said, an equilibrium. But then there's how we actually distribute cognition through that, those nodes. Mm. Mm. Well, I mean, your cognition is, is, is a systemic thing as well, you know. And I, I guess it all comes down to um, contextual thinking, you know, mm. being able to be part of a context, but to be able to be embedded so profoundly within a context that your cognition stretches out into that context, into all the landscape and relationships, you know, within that context. If you have that kind of cognition then you, you, you know, your brain is running like a supercomputer and that's why we developed this massive organ with the potential for trillions of, of neural connections is it's not because we never use, I mean, we must've used that at some stage to develop it. Right. Mm. I mean, yeah. it wouldn't have evolved unless we were using it at some stage. We're certainly not using it now and where our IQs are supposed to be better than, you know, back when they started measuring it, those original eugenicists who were measuring IQs for the Nazis, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, at some stage before this era of modernity, people had to have been using those brains for something else. And if you, you know, spend time with any indigenous communities, you'll see there's a very different kind of cognition going on. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. very complex, very interrelated, very interconnected, and it's not uh, brain bound or even body bound. You know, it extends out into your relationships with people, you know, so that you share neural processes with people you share neural processes, you, you have that kind of haptic cognition, you know, that extends into the tools that you're using and the things you're making and the way you position the things you make in that local economy, you know, whether it's a sharing economy or otherwise, and then your understanding of knowing where that thing is going and what it's being used for. <laughs> it's a real network. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I, I kind of, I, so I started responding to a question that I, I can't remember the question now. 
Well, we were talking about distributed <laughs> cognition. Yeah, and, and just and just uh, because I mean, when, if you look at business and we look at how where humanity can go next, you know, from mm. an evolutionary point of view, uh, and we look at the starfish, we look at there. There's creatures around us that have mm. distributed cognition extremely yep. successfully. We haven't really paid much attention or learned from that, but we can. And yeah. and and when we look at how distributed cognition works in companies or in in the world, what kinds of things w- would show up how would that work the idea of a a distributive pattern whether it's for thinking or um anything else you know that is a pattern that if you start thinking in that way it will extend out into the systems around you that you're interacting with you know so um i mean i do talk about violence in the book because you were saying like bad things happen and a system that's diverse has resilience to cope with the bad things but I mean, if those bad things are, you know, something like violence, for example, it's um, that violence is supposed to be distributed throughout the system. So, you know, all agents within that system are supposed to have access to the tools and, um, and competencies of violence. You know, if you concentrate, if you disallow all of the nodes in your system from having access to violence, but then you concentrate that violence into the hands of a few, you're going to get problems. You know, if you empower one group of people to be the only people who are allowed to exercise violence, <laughs> yeah, you're going to get problems. And eventually the system's going to burr up about that and you're going to end up with a whole heap of um, angry nodes tipping over, <laughs> you, tipping over your cruiser. Yeah, it's fire. like angry birds. Like, again, another animation coming up. <laughs> yeah, you do not <laughs> do that. So, you know, the things that we regard as bad things like, you know, disasters and, you know, different collapses and revolutions and evolutions and all these things, the things that we think of as disruptive. I mean, what are they disrupting? You know, they're disrupting this illusion of normalcy and this illusion of eternal homeostasis that just doesn't exist. Mm. The rich understand that they understand that really well. They're not bothered at all by any crisis. And when I say this crisis, I mean, I don't know, maybe a month ago, I could have said this crisis to you and you'd know which one I was talking about. <laughs> yeah. Now we have choice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We have options. You know, we, <laughs> it's been so funny to be in Australia for the last year. It's like, <laughs> you know, the crisis was water for a while. And we had billions of fish dying off in all the rivers. And, and then all, all of a sudden it rained. So everyone forgot about that crisis now and just went back to like ripping all the water out of the river to water all these ridiculous crops to pile into surpluses and then to like secretly destroy half of them to create more demand (laughs) Mm. so that there's subsidized crops that they produced in the first place, you know, because they're subsidized for how much they produce, but then they have to destroy a bunch of it. So there's enough demand (laughs) <laughs> it's just it's insane cycles and meanwhile the the salinity is increasing in the land and it's just every, the last bits of nutrient are being washed out of that and back into this dying river that was a crisis five minutes ago but then it rained and people forgot about it then we had the bushfires here you would have heard about that oh yes um, yeah the smoke's cleared now so that's not a crisis anymore it's not a crisis the fire's not burning but the the ecological damage and the mismanagement of all this land yeah. and the, the, the kind of um, it's, it's the way things uh, are just sort of enclosed and kept static until they just rot and build up these fuel loads and, and, and then explode every 10 years. It's a crisis now. No one's talking about that one. And then all of a sudden it's the next crisis and the next crisis. And every single one of these crises can be tracked back if you track you, you'll track it back to one thing and that's, um, and that's the misuse of land. And the misuse of land is coming out from this idea of using land as capital, which yeah. it shouldn't be because you, you have to like fence off and block off all these little squares of land so that you can have an item of value that you can leverage for debt and then speculate on that into infinity. And basically that kills the land. It's like a curse, you know, 
because mm. you're um you're not allowing uh, all the nodes in your landscape in your natural system to to connect with each other and to exchange information and energy and resources and materials across throughout that system mm. oh we've got national park we've got like a billion hectares of bloody national parks what are you talking about yeah, a national park is a little island of death. Every ecosystem moves a couple hundred meters. So yeah, ecosystems move hundreds of meters every year. Mm. So you enclose this this national park area, you're killing it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because that it needs to be connected with other things and, and moving around. I guess for the answer for all this, you could see on, on this uh, boomerang here, you might not recognize that as a boomerang because you'd be used to that idea of something that's like, like that, that, that <laughs> angle and, and you throw it and it comes back and everyone thinks that's a boomerang, but that, that's a toy we used to make for kids <laughs> or like, you know, like a bit of fun yeah. or sometimes it might be used as a decoy to imitate the flight of a hawk to sort of scare birds in general direction, that kind. We got lots of kinds of boomerangs and here's, here's one. And that, that doesn't come back. You throw it straight and it kills what you're throwing it at. <laughs> and I guess if we're talking about that distributed cognition, that haptic cognition, you know, there's a lot of knowledge that's um, stored on this. It's kind of about what we're talking about. Because mm -hmm. uh, this boomerang sort of maps and tracks the way sand mm -hmm. uh, moves along the coastline. Yeah. And yeah. Then, For those of you that are just listening to this, the, the boomerang is very intricately carved. Yeah, and it kind currents. of maps a lot of those interactions. And, but the interesting thing you can see is blockages in there and, and the way that system responds to blockages. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, all right, so cool. if Thank you've you. got real estate, and it comes back to land as capital again, you've got real estate on one beach and you build a rock spit to try and keep all that sand on that beach because, of course, waves come up and they wash the sand away. That happens all the time. So you put a rock spit there to prevent that, to try and slow that erosion of the sand. And then you go and dredge the sand from somewhere else. And then you, you know, you pay millions to have that, that sand just sort of spat back up on your beach to maintain that, the facility of, of those wealthy people who live on that real estate along that beach and maintain the property values. That actually blocks the flows of sand along that coast. And what they don't understand is when the sand washes away, it comes back around again, like just wait for a bit. <laughs> <laughs> be patient. <laughs> it's, but that sand is supposed to be recycled around through that little system. It's supposed to be moving. If you block it somewhere, then, you know, 10 kilometers down, down the coast, that place is going to fall into the sea, especially if you're dredging <laughs> mm. sand further out and mm. everything's slumping down into those which unfortunately we have to be dredging now anyway, because sand is the biggest resource on the planet and um, the terrestrial sources of that sand have run out now. So, you know, with all the infrastructure going through the roof, the main thing that these buildings are made out of is sand. I don't think most people realize. Mm. And so all that has to come out of the ocean. And so there's, I mean, the, <laughs> people are worried about oceans rising and yeah, they, they are gradually, but I think in the sort of shorter term, they need to worry more about the coastlines just falling into the sea um, because you're taking all the sand out of the ocean bed. Yeah. It's kind of more immediate problem. So this um, is where we start talking about the shift between, you know, shift mm, from, I would hope, exploitation yeah. and extraction to something that's more regenerative. Yeah. Well, well that was all a metaphor, of course. Um, it was a, a sort of, I don't know. There are probably too many moving parts for it to be a metaphor. Maybe it's an analogy. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. But certainly in the way that you're running your business, you don't want to run it like those wealthy people trying to keep all the sand on their beach. Yeah. Shore uh, it up. Keep it. Yeah. Well, that's probably the equivalent to that would be the shareholder, you know, paying, yeah. you know, the shareholder value going back to reimburse executives yeah. for, so it's an artificial completely. If you, artificial if you want, um, if you want, you know, to have plenty of sand on your beach, you need to look after the entire coastline mm. and make sure that that cyclic thing is happening with the sand being recycled around. And some people might think, well, that's communism, but no, that's not communism. <laughs> Natural system. <laughs> you know, I've never heard of that. Yeah. Communism. That's pretty... Yeah. Communism would be doing exactly the same thing. And then like, you know, just trying to make sure that everybody had access to that little bit of beach on that spit. It still ignores the whole coastline. 
So it's not an either or proposition once again. You know, you, you do have to be more big picture. You might think that you're in competition for that sand, you know, against the rest of the coastline. And I think if you're doing that, then your business isn't going to last long. Yeah. 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 I mean, I've, in the work I've done with ecological projects and so forth, what people frequently do not understand is the cumulative effects of anything you do. So mm. it's just one, everybody can look at it and rationalize. Well, that's just this, it's just small. It's just, but yeah. you keep it doing that. You keep, and it all adds up. Um, mm. You know, the closest thing we have to it is what happens when we have appliances that we leave plugged in all the time. It's still using yeah. power, but yeah. you know, it, nobody notices it because the light's not on, but yet, when you add it all up incrementally, it, it adds up quite a bit. So, yeah. yeah. You know, the worst thing about that beach analogy, <laughs> the, the rich people on that beach, they didn't pay to have that spit made, you know, like the local government had to do that. Like it, that had to come out of taxes, you know, that all gets subsidized. They, they, they're not having to pay to get the sand dredged and put on their beach. You know, that's everyone who lives along the coastline, all those poor bastards, who are struggling further down the beach, they're paying for all that to happen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for the entire system to be destroyed so that like one small fraction can try and maintain the illusion of normalcy for a minute. Yeah, you know? Yeah. And the whole coastline drops into the sea and then we're, everyone's going, oh, when the, when the sand comes back, when things return back to normal, well, you know, the reality is that coastline's not going back how it was there'll be a new beach. You need to wait for a little bit until it sorts itself out. There will be a new beach, but it's going to be in a very different place. Mm -hmm. It's probably not going to fall in the, you know, the GPS marked out square that, that you've paid a million dollars for, you know, that's probably going to be under the water. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. it, yeah. Things aren't going back to that normal, but there'll be a new normal, not even normal. It's just, that's just how things go. Coastlines mm -hmm. move anyway mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah so now i'm going to do a random turn and and ask you about where does the role of ego and authority fit in the context of a building of increasing relationships increasing overall mm. yeah yeah i like the idea of linking those two things together you know so well, we're talking about distributed models of cognition but there are, you know, distributive models of leadership as well. Mm -hmm. And, and that's not a hierarchy either because that doesn't work. Okay. Tell say more about that. Yeah. So it's more like uh, that concept of dynamic subordination. Have you come across that one? <laughs> I can There's imagine it. Your, uh, you know, your game theorists and stuff like that are talking that up and a lot of your sort of agile, you know, people are talking about that a little bit too, but this mm -hmm. dynamic subordination, it's like uh, in the Navy SEALs, they have to be able to switch leadership roles in a second as the context changes. Right. And it yeah. needs to be nonverbal and everybody needs to know, you know, Oh, okay. Uh, we're in a blizzard, you know, Craig is the leader now because <laughs> he has the snow skills. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Uh, but they don't have to say that they just know and they shift. Yeah. It's yeah. the same in, in Aboriginal hmm. societies because our knowledge is distributed, you know, and everybody has a different bit. It might be, you know, that this woman speaks for that stretch of river on this side of the river bank. And then, um, you know, uh, this man speaks for that hill over there and has all the knowledge of that. And it might be that a group of people are walking along the river. And I guess that woman who knows that place and speaks for that place, uh, the leadership will move to her. People will look for her for guidance as to where they're going to go and what they're allowed to do and what they can and can't do there. But then they head up the hill a little bit and, and they go, Oh, that's, this man speaks for that place. Oh, he's not here. Uh, who's his, Oh, we've got his nephew here. And so suddenly there's a, a 10 year old kid who's has a leadership role because he has the knowledge from his uncle, you know? And so he'll speak for that. So it's this dynamic subordination. It's not that there's no hierarchy, but that shifts depending on the context. And I guess all of your agile teams are people who need to be able to do that. And that I, agile is sort of halfway there, but they still kind of have this command. It's kind of like making people feel like 
they have some agency underneath the command and control structure. <laughs> know what I mean? Oh, it's absolutely. More like it's yeah. more like trying to trying to make people feel like they're in something that's working uh, naturally and, and, and in complexity. It's not there yet, but it's getting there. No, it's people just like one foot sticking the all, you know, in, in one place and then trying to edge out into the new. There's yeah, a lot and of so splits. So when we start on. to talk about ego and authority, you know, we're really talking about this this um, uniquely human problem of narcissism, which has been around forever. You know, you can't just suddenly say that it popped up on a bloody island in the northern hemisphere <laughs> x thousand years ago, and that it's their fault. You know, it's not. It's been a problem, and all human communities and uh, systems of governance have, and even economies, these have evolved to, um, to contain the excesses of, of these narcissists, people who are taken over by that. But then also for ourselves, because everybody has a, the best person you know has a seed of narcissism in them. Our, our, our cultures, our spiritualities, our economies, our governance systems are all there uh, to check, to provide checks and balances to that and to keep us on that path away from narcissism. I guess, you know, you, you game theorists talk about, uh, you know, the Dunbar number and everything and, mm -hmm. and that those systems that, that actually contain, uh, have traditionally been transparent and where everybody's known what's going on and so those things are controlled, that that doesn't scale well. And once it gets past a certain number of people, you know, you end up with um, uh, defectors, you know, and I guess those defectors are narcissists, but they have four kinds, they say, come out that you've got defectors, freeloaders, uh, sociopaths and, and predators, you know, emerge in those systems when things start scaling. But I would say that, that there's, if a system starts scaling, you know, beyond the population that beyond the population that's sustainable, then I'd say narcissism has taken over that system already. Because if you look at all indigenous cultures, these have been uh, things that try to maintain uh, stable populations and have very strong purposeful mechanisms to maintain stable populations. Because, you know, it doesn't scale. Mm -hmm. So once you decide that you're going to start stockpiling food, you're going to start creating surpluses you're going to start intensively extracting from the land once you make that choice your stuff you need hierarchies and so the people who make that choice in the first place are people who want to be at the top of a pile otherwise they wouldn't be making a pile you know mm -hmm. and yeah. that's the freeloaders that's the defectors that's the sociopaths it's all them you know so you end up with yeah when we talk about ego and authority if you've got um authority being concentrated and kept around one individual or even worse, the dynasty extending from that individual, which, you know, it's, it's, I think it's really good that America is finally going to have a female president, but I don't think Ivanka is, is the best bet. You're going to get <laughs> these dynasties of concentrated power. And it's the same as those bastards on the beach who are trying to keep all the sand there. You know, they're destroying the coast and eventually they're going to lose their little beach. Yeah. Um, it's, there's something about that ego, that narcissism, that is, is like a death wish. It's like, I hate myself and I don't mind me and my descendants all being destroyed in a big bowl of fire, just as long as I get to be boss. Indulge. And in control and indulge mm. everything that I need indulged. Mm as long as I can control, as long as I am greater than, and that's, that's the thing. Mm. One of the things I absolutely love as a, I'm going to say metaphor because it's handy, but is murmuration is, you know, just watching flocks of birds do, do their beautiful dance. Mm. And I keep hoping that at some point, I mean, a little bit about what you talked about in terms of distributed leadership echoes mm. that, but I also have this visual that at some point companies will run like this, where it is, you know, there, there are no boundaries per se, but yet there is a synchronization, you know, a lot of, a lot of subtle signaling. I haven't yet heard a scientific explanation that feels right to me. And that's the only way I can talk about it. It just doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel complete because there's so many little meta signals going on in those shifts 
that if we are to pull that off as a species, we're going to have to get really good at sensing, really good at, at a deeper set of skills that have to do with working in complex, fast moving systems. Mm. Mm. I'd love to hear your perception, perspective, your insights on murmuration and just all of that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, at that kind of thinking, I mean, that comes back to distributive cognition. It, it can't just be held in, in one person's mind. You know, you need a network of minds to make that work. You know, those birds, those fish, you know, artifacts on a computer screen that you set in motion. You, they have just a, not very many, just a few simple operating protocols, I guess. You know, they've got three or four basic rules they have to follow. You know, that little dot on your screen that says, okay, we'll maintain a constant velocity, avoid collisions. I don't know, a couple of things. Not very many, just, just two or three or four. And then you let them go with 30 others on the screen. Suddenly they'll start dancing together, you know? You yeah. didn't program that pattern of how they dance together. It was a very simple program that you put for each one. But they're coming into those patterns of creation and they're, um, and they, they're connected and they're acting dynamically. Birds are a bit more complex and, and fish are a bit more complex than that. You know, they're responding to a lot of factors in a much more complex system than a simple computer screen when they're flying. But I guess, yeah. Ah, oh, see, it makes me want to backtrack into statistics. <laughs> Let's I guess not do bit, that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, here's the thing. It's, it's, um, you can't anticipate where a flock of birds is going to go. If no. you pay attention to the outliers, if you see uh. one that falls behind, then you can pretty much nine times out of 10 guarantee that the entire flock is going to swing around and go back the other way. Beautiful. If you see one that starts to pull out to the side, then you'll see that the whole thing will move. And then, but that it's that dynamic subordination again, you know, everybody always wants to look at the V lead bird that's at the front, but that's not what steers things. It's the outliers mm -hmm. and the pattern breakers and the interesting things. It's that those tails of the distribution. You can't like take that story from the tail of the, that the distrib distribution and go, ah, oh, we're going to map that over the whole thing. Ah, oh, the schools that are doing the best are, are small schools. All right, well, we're going to take every school and break it up into like eight small schools and the whole system. No, nah. because that's that uniformity again. You've just got to, you know, yeah. you pay attention to the outliers, but then you also, you maintain that uh, the rest of the bell curve as well. <laughs> mm. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. One last question for you. What can you suggest would be a um, guiding compass for people who are in the thick of observing, experiencing, being a part of the, the you know, it's kind of like a birthing process, I would say, mm. at the mm. moment in terms of whatever shifts we choose to go through next. Is there something that, that um, people can use to sort of anchor and, and feel grounded and rooted in themselves and in, and with, with the earth to, um, to navigate this with some greater peace. Mm. Well, look, um, trauma doesn't come from damage or an act of disruption. You know, that moment of damage or disruption is not the trauma. Trauma is merely your failure to make meaning appropriately and contextually around what's happening and that's all tra trauma is it's your your failure to make sense of something mm. um yeah Beautiful. and we could go into i could i could go on about that forever but maybe that's just something to think about um yeah because we're people keep going round and round in these cycles of trauma and we talk about our trauma and we share our feelings about it and we keep going under the water and round and round and round about it but like like yeah get your feelings out good and quick, you've got to get rid of that. But then you also need to make meaning around that and figure out and make sense of that within a bigger context. And, and you need to keep going. Yeah. It's a tremendous, in my point of view, it's a tremendous opportunity we're in right now to expand, you mm. know, to see well past the boundaries of what we've previously mm. seen and to really reach into a whole new territory. I think, I think there's, there, there's some security to be found in our capacity to be more than who we currently are in yeah. this moment. And that's what maybe, these, these do. maybe 
maybe we could even do more than expand and we could increase. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Tyson, thank you very, very much for being on the program with me. I know we could keep on going, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks. great fun. I uh, just, thanks for your respect with just engaging um, at, at a rigorous level. Oh gosh, it's, this is so much fun always, for me. It doesn't always happen. <laughs> it's so much fun for me. That's why I, I say we can yeah. keep going. You know, it's, yeah. it, it's just such a blessing for me. So mm -hmm. thank you very, very much for, for allowing me to do that and to, to yeah. play and just, oh, uh, just, yeah. Just roll. thanks for the res respect of engaging, you know, at that level with me. It's, it's refreshing. Oh, thank you. well, thank you. Yeah. My gosh. Thank you. I'm Donna Jones. I provide personal growth for business, mentoring leaders and decision makers who are really ready to adapt their awareness and inner skill set to both meet and match the complexity and speed of change. I also bring intuitive insight into decision making and leadership expansion so that collaboration can benefit from conflicting perspectives and higher trust. I am betting a healthy balance between certainty and uncertainty. Growth at a personal and organizational level has a serious chance. Contact me through LinkedIn or through www.fromInsight2Action.com. And it's Donna, D-A-W-N-A.